tonight. Breaking news, Nicola Sturgeon's husband, the former SNP chief executive, has been re-arrested. Peter Murrell was arrested earlier today as part of a police investigation into the SNP's funding and finances. Also tonight, the Conservative MP Mark Menzies is suspended from the Parliamentary Party after allegations he abused local party funds to pay off what he called bad people. I'll be speaking to the chair of the Labour Party, Annalise Dodds. She has written to the Conservatives to question how quick they were to deal with the case. Also tonight, as the Scottish Government abandons a key climate goal, I'll speak to the SNP's coalition partners, the Scottish Greens. And as Kemi Badenoch gives another speech, we'll ask if she's planting future leadership challenge seeds while still appearing loyal to Rishi Sunak. And with Taylor Swift's new album out tomorrow, we are getting in on the act. We asked a fancy new AI generator to write us songs in her style about Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. All that and more with Tim Montgomery and Alva Ray. You'll be with us for the next hour. It's Thursday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Well, we start the programme tonight with that breaking news. Peter Morrell, the former chief executive of the SNP, husband of Nicola Sturgeon, has been re-arrested as part of a police investigation into the SNP's funding and finances. He was taken into custody this morning, which was nearly a year after his first arrest. Well, let's take a look back first, shall we, at how this story has all unfolded, because Police Scotland formally opened Operation Branch Form in July 2021, following complaints about donations to the SNP. In December 2022, it emerged that Peter Morrell had loaned the SNP £100,000. The party said that was to help with what they described as a cash flow issue after the election that year. Two months later, Nicola Sturgeon resigned as First Minister of Scotland. Shortly after that, her husband also resigned as the party's chief executive, a role he held for over 20 years. And then in April 2023, he was arrested and police searched the couple's home in Glasgow. He was later released without charge. In June of that year, the same year, Nicola Sturgeon was also arrested and she was released seven hours later. Today, Peter Morrell arrested for a second time. Well, our Scotland correspondent, Connor Gillies, has the latest. Another difficult moment for the SNP and a significant moment in what has been dubbed Operation Branch Form, the long-running police investigation here in Scotland examining the Scottish National Party's funding and finances, the largest political party in Scotland, the party of government. And the man re-arrested this evening is Peter Murrow, 59-year-old, went into custody this morning as a suspect, according to police, at 9.13 this morning and is is facing a barrage of questions, particularly around the SNP's funding and finances. Uh, we're limited in what we can say clearly for legal reasons here, but what we know about Operation Branch Form is that it was an investigation triggered following a complaint a number of years ago uh, from a number of individuals, and within that was an examination of around £600,000 that was fundraised for the cause of a second Scottish independence referendum and there are questions about that funding. Now, the police have been examining the facts here, have been examining the evidence and people will remember last year that very, very dramatic moment where the home of Peter Murrow, the one-time long-serving chief executive of the SNP, the home that he shares with the former First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, until not very long ago, was raided by officers uh, to Detectives were swarming that property for a whole day. Uh, they erected a tent in the front garden in what captured headlines across the world. Uh, Peter Murrow was later released without charge, pending further inquiry. Skip forward a period of weeks and Nicola Sturgeon herself found herself in a police custody suite facing questions under arrest. She later, after a period of 10, 11 hours, was released without charge pending further inquiries. And then came the arrest and similar process, released without charge, of Colin Beatty, the one-time treasurer of the SNP as well. Now, political opponents here at Holyrood clearly are limited 
in what they can say, but there is no doubt this is a tricky time once again for the SNP. What happens next as part of this police investigation? Well, the facts are that in Scotland, the police can detain a suspect for up to 12 hours and then they can make the decision about applying for an extension around that questioning period for a further 12 hours. They can decide to charge an individual or they can take that third option of releasing them without charge pending further inquiries. All eyes on the next couple of hours for further developments here in Scotland, but no doubt this is a significant moment. The long-time former chief executive of the SNP in police custody, once again facing questions about the party's funding and financing. Connie Glee is there uh, explaining that story to us. Now, there is another story uh, that I want to talk to you about tonight. It's the kind of story that's known in the industry as a marmalade dropper. Now, Mark Menzies, the Conservative MP for Field in Lancashire, has been suspended by the party while it investigates an extraordinary set of allegations against him, according to The Times. In the early hours of the morning last year, he called an elderly aide asking for help because bad people had locked him up and were demanding money from him. Now, his office manager eventually paid over £6,000 from her personal bank account, The Times reports, and she was then later reimbursed using money raised by donors for local Conservative campaigning. Now, this isn't the only time that Mark Menzies is alleged to have used money from the campaign fund to cover his personal expenses. In 2020, he reportedly used thousands of pounds of donations to pay for his private medical bills. Now, look, it's really important to say that he disputes the allegations. He's told The Times that he's always complied with all of the rules. But it does raise questions about whether there's enough transparency surrounding donations to local parties and MPs. And there's a wider point as well, because this is just the latest case of a Conservative MP losing the whip over allegations of wrongdoing at a time when trust in politics and representatives in Westminster is already so low. So our political correspondent Darren McCaffrey reports now on the latest allegations to hit the Conservative Party. There was a time when Mark Menzies was a rising star in the Conservatives, but now he finds himself marred again in scandal, under investigation, suspended by the party and removed from his government job. According to The Times, the latest incident dates back to last December, when Menzies woke his elderly former campaign manager at 3.15am, asking for £5,000 as he'd been locked in a flat by what he claimed were bad people. A few hours later, the amount demanded had risen to 6500 with his current constituency manager, Shirley Green, using her savings to revive the money. Green was then reimbursed from funds donated by local Conservatives. And yet the following day, Menzies demanded yet another £35,000 for medical bills. It wasn't until January that the Conservative chief whip was told and an investigation launched. Only when the allegations were about to become public did Mark Menzies lose the whip and his envoy job. He told The Times, I strongly dispute the allegations put to me. I fully complied with all the rules for declarations. It's not the first time he's found himself in trouble. In 2014, he resigned from the government over claims he'd paid for sex and drugs. Three years later, he was questioned by police over bizarre accusations he deliberately got a dog drunk. In both cases, he said, the allegations were malicious and the police never took any action. He has had the whip withdrawn. It's further information that the chief whip I understand became familiar with yesterday uh, and action's been swiftly taken on the basis of that further information. But Labour are now demanding for the investigation to go further. There are obviously a lot of unanswered questions in relation to these allegations, not least why it seems the Conservative Party took so long to act and whether they've reported this to the police, who it seems to me should be involved in this. An MP accused of wrongdoing is, frankly, nothing new. You'd be forgiven, actually, for losing count of the number who've either lost the whip or had to resign this parliament in the midst of scandal. And yet, while this is not just a Conservative problem, it does, frankly, feel more acute for them at the moment, simply because the party finds itself in such political peril. One of the things that makes Files such a special place are the people who live here. For the people of his usually safe coastal Conservative seat, it's fair to say voters are not happy. If you were imprisoned by somebody overnight, you'd call the police, wouldn't you? 
particularly in his position, I think. I think I would. He should have gone months ago when it first came out. It's been covered up, hasn't it? They tell us what to do and they don't have the same moral inclinations as most other people around here. So he shouldn't be standing at all. Depending on the investigation, it may in the end not be up to his constituents whether Mark Menzies survives or not. But in the meantime, this is yet another headache for the Prime Minister, and one he frankly can ill afford to have. Well, Darren joins us now. Um, Darren, it came out in your report, didn't it? I mean, it's not just an isolated allegation against Mark Menzies, is it? It's not. I mean, first of all, this is a proper wow story. You know, there's very few people reading this, and we saw this reflected, didn't we, from those constituents. I mean, there's kind of a comical edge to it in some ways, given how extraordinary some of the allegations are. But there is a, as you say, a more serious edge to this. First of all, you know, he's always denied allegations, and we should be very clear the police have never pursued any of them thus far. But there is seemingly a pattern of behaviour here that may open wider questions about, you know, his uh, propriety to be an MP, if you like. And second of all, is this big question about donations, and that's mm. clearly what Labour are interested in today, suggesting the police should get involved. We should say uh, the police have issued a statement, by the way, this evening, in which they say that no formal complaint has been made, but they are aware of those media reports. So, yeah, you know, it is quite extraordinary stuff. And as I also try to reflect on my piece, this is what Rishi Sunak does not need. I mean, he really just does not need another scandal involving another Conservative MP. This is it, isn't it? We'll hear from Annalise Dodds later in the programme who's written to the chair of the Conservative Party. And, you know, as you say in the report, it's important not to say that this is not just Conservative MPs mm -hmm. who are caught up in these scandals. But, again, it is, it's a bit of a nightmare for Rishi Sunak. Yeah, I think it is on two levels. So, first of all, you could look at today, when you look at those two top stories that you've been covering in this programme and go, this has been quite a good day for Labour. It's taken Angela Rayner off the front pages and it's put, essentially, the SNP, the main political opponent, if you like, for Labour in Scotland, back on the front pages for all the wrong reasons, and it's done the same with the Conservatives in England. So you could say this has been a good day politically for Labour. And second of all, I always think back, and I don't know how your panellists are going to think about this uh, later when you talk to them, is that when you think about 1997, there was this kind of... There has been this thought mm. process that everyone was driven towards new Labour. And you look at where we are with Keir Starman, there's a poll out today saying, you know, a lot of people do not want him to become Prime Minister. But in the end, the reason Blair won in 97 by such a large majority is because loads of Conservatives didn't necessarily switch to Labour, they stayed at home. Mm. John Major got a bigger number of votes than Tony Blair did in 1992. And I think the fear for the Conservatives this time round is not that loads of people have switched to Labour. Lots of traditional Conservative voters, because of stories like this, mm. will just not simply turn out to vote. And that is what really could be damaging for the Conservative Party. Governments lose elections yes. rather than opposition Opposition's winning. Uh, winning. Uh, Darren, indeed. thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, well, the allegations uh, that we've been discussing against Mark Menzies do feature in this week's electoral dysfunction podcast with the former leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Ruth Davidson, saying she'd be surprised if he's still an MP by the end of the week. It is utterly jaw-dropping. Like, it is so out with the bounds of mm. what being a responsible uh, elected member is and how you treat your constituency association, that, that it is staggering, like, utterly staggering. Mm. But the Tories were supposedly told about this three months ago, mm. and and we this is the first we're hearing about it. And, and by reading the story, it looks very much like this lady told her local association, raised the red flag, then told uh, the parliamentary authorities, the chief whip, then told CCHQ, which is Tory HQ, mm. nothing's happened, and mm. now she's quoted in the newspapers. So, I mean... It does appear that there's local association wrath about the way they've been treated by this mm. MP. So, you know, I, I think this is a, a, a very difficult one and I would find it difficult to believe that a, an investigation can be held and he can be cleared in time to stand at a general election. In fact, I would be surprised if he survives the week here and okay. doesn't just resign. Now, you can listen to the full interview in the Electoral Dysfunction podcast, available from 6am tomorrow morning. And if you scan the QR code, you can also see on your screen now that you can subscribe or listen back to the previous episodes in the series as well. Right, let's bring in our duo for this evening, shall we? The Conservative commentator Tim Montgomery and the political journalist Alva Ray. Thank you so much for being uh, with us. Tim, to you first. <sighs> We've got to be careful, obviously, because Mark Menzies denies the allegations, he denies breaking the rules. But it is a, a nightmare for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? Extraordinary. Now, now, you two are both too young, probably, to remember this game, but there was a game that I used to play when I was younger called Go For Broke. 
And it was like you started, I think, with £1,000, and the person who won the game was the one who threw away the money the quickest. And I do sometimes wake up and I think the party I support is trying how badly can we lose the next election. And I've been on your show before, Sophie, mm -hmm. and said I think it's time for Rishi Sunak to go. I don't think he's leading the party well, but who would want to lead the Conservative Party at the moment? The stories get worse and worse and worse. And it's one of the reasons I've thought for a long time I can completely understand why the Prime Minister wants to delay the election. He hopes yeah. better news is ahead. Something will turn up to rescue the Conservative Party. But the reason overall I think the party needs to go soon, not just for the sake of the country and voters' patience, but I, my worry is the longer this parliament goes on, the longer the Tories stay in power, the angrier the voters are rightly going to be at stories like this. So when should you call an election then, do you think? Now? Or... Well, I don't think you would... Well, there's an opinion poll today <laughs> um, from Ipsos Mori, and I think they've been polling since 1978, and they've got the Tories at the lowest rating they've ever had in that series. So calling an election now or soon <laughs> is a huge gamble. I'm glad I'm not the Prime Minister, mm. I'm just a pundit. Mm. But I don't think, mm. even though it would be brave to call it soon, I think it would be the right decision because it's... I honestly think the chances are every week is a bad news week for the Tories these days. The idea that it's going to get better by the autumn, I think, is a fool's hope. What stood out to me from Darren's report was the constituents, the kind of mm. exasperation, if yeah. you like. Um, it does feel, doesn't it, like so many people are feeling they're all the same, they're, they're, they couldn't, the opinion of NMPs couldn't be any lower and what a surprise, it's, it's another scandal. Yeah, and I think that there's a kind of question for viewers, maybe, as to whether they interpret this as a conservative problem or mm -hmm. a problem with, with politics more widely, mm. because the latter is really damaging. I mean, you can, you can get rid of the conservatives at the next election if you want to, but if you just start to see politics as being mm. fundamentally broken mm. and you just associate MPs with this kind of scandal in a way that I think we are maybe approaching, and it's not just conservative MPs being, you know, embroiled with stories like this, even though there are more of them than Labour. I think it's just a real challenge for our politics. And you do hear Labour figures talking about this, that um, there'll be pressure on Keir Starmer if he wants to kind of deliver on this mm. and, and restore a bit of faith into politics so that you don't mm. keep having politicians being elected in with a lot of hope and optimism and some some key promises and then not delivering on them and then just having lots of scandal, which is kind of what we've seen in the in the past few years. Yeah, I think you, you talk to MPs of all parties and they say they go door knocking and it's just something that comes up a lot on the doorstep. Um, Tim, you said you said previously on this programme, mm. uh, you said again tonight that you think it's time for Rishi Sunak to go. I mean, I guess the pinch point is potentially the local elections, uh, mm. if he does end up having a bad night uh, at the beginning of May. Mm. And how do you think the mood in the Conservative Party is? It's very, very bleak. And I don't think the average Conservative blames Rishi Sunak for the extent of the Conservative problems, but I think there is almost a universal consensus amongst the people I've talked to now that he isn't making it better. Mm. And a phrase that I've used that I you know, increasingly hear repeated is, he can't do politics. He's a good man, he's a wise man, he's a very good technical leader, but actually everything politically he's tried to do hasn't worked. And when you are as low as the Conservative Party is in the polls, one more roll of the dice. The only thing the party has really left is a change of leader. We're two weeks away, I think, Sophie, mm. from the big crunch moment. And on a WhatsApp group of sort of Conservative commentators I belong to, I think the, the mood is sort of turning now and people think that something is going to happen in two weeks. The local election results are probably going to be disastrous, mm -hmm. particularly if Ben Houch and Anandi Street both lose their mayoralties. And I think either Rishi Sunak will initiate a sort of 1995-style back-me-or-sack-me leadership race and say we've got to end this speculation once and for all, or there will be a challenge. We're now, I think, partly if, with uh, Mark Menzies' suspension, mm. 52 MPs now need to trigger a leadership contest. I think very likely in two weeks' time we will have some kind of leadership contest in the Conservative Party. And I can hear Brenda from Bristol saying, no, not again, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> not another one. Um, but that is the mood in the Conservative Party at the moment. It's very, very febrile. Well, and you think Rishi Sunak could even trigger one himself? Because... I think it would be wise for him to do so, actually, because if he does say, for example, want to hold on to the autumn, and this leadership issue is live, and it is live, we don't want, or he doesn't want to spend the summer with this thing hanging over his 
in a head. Better to come out there and say, there is all this speculation, I want the parliamentary party to get behind me. Um, and you... I think he should do that, and I think he will do that. And would you want to see him replaced with one of these other contenders? But, but personally, I think he should... I just don't think he can do politics. It's a big risk for the Conservative Party, but I, I do not know many Conservative MPs. If I you gave them the option now and said, you can have the 1997 result, they would take it. Who would you go for, then? Who's the, who's the knight in shining armour? Well, I don't think the, there is a perfect the, person, interest. because I think if David Cameron, for example, was in the House of Commons, I think it would be over already. David Cameron would have been reinstalled as the Conservative leader. But David he's Cameron, mm. like, yeah. mm. back to the future. Back to the future. But you look at him on the world stage, he looks the part. He has that authority. Um, he's not there, so he can't... He's in the House of Lords. Um, personally, I would go for Tom Tugendhat. I think he's a fresh uh, military man. He believes in public service. He has an agenda. But there isn't, there isn't an obvious person who's going to transform the Tory... This is about defeat minimisation, not about victory. I look at, I can imagine my phone, I'm going to check it afterwards, going to be blowing up with Conservative MPs who are going to be moaning about the thought of David Cameron coming back <laughs> <laughs> to party lead at Wondering. I mean, it's so interesting because it chimes what we've been hearing at Bloomberg uh, mm. that maybe there could be some cabinet resignations after the, the local and mayoral results. Mm. It feels like we're in a bit of a holding pattern just waiting for those. Mm. But that's not expected to be good, even if Ben Hodgson manages to hold on to his seat as mm. Conservative mayor in Tees Valley. Mm. And then I think that could, you know, it could all be to play for, especially if we see cabinet resignations. There'll be more of that on Saturday. And, uh, oh. yeah, two weeks, uh, <laughs> two weeks until, uh, as Tim was saying, those um, May election uh, results, local election results. So definitely we'll have lots of coverage here as well on that. It's going to be worth uh, tuning in for. You're watching The Politics Hub. Coming up, we will hear from the Labour Party chair, Annelise Dodds, on this story. Plus, the Scottish Government ditches a key climate change target, saying it's out of reach. In tailored suits. And we turn to AI to see if our political leaders could inspire future Taylor Swift hits. I think some of the articles are a little bit misleading. So let's remember what vegan food is, first of all. It's food that's free from meat, dairy, eggs and fish. And a message for all vegans and the entire nation is that what we need to be focusing on is fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, whole grains. Those are the foods that are going to help prevent disease, feed your good gut bacteria, our good gut bacteria eat fibre, help us maintain a healthy weight really, really easily without dieting. Those are the foods we really, really need to be focusing on. But sometimes when people hear the word vegan food, they think all of the processed foods, and they can play a part. This is all vegan food in front of you, isn't this, it? This is all vegan food, absolutely. Would you eat it? I eat mostly whole foods, mostly plant-based whole foods, and that's what maintains my health, my gut, great energy, um, and hopefully is going to help prevent disease in my later life. Processed red meat and red meat are classified as type 1 and type 2 carcinogens, so we do need to worry about things like potential disease later in life. There's many other ways of making this sort of food. You can make it with other... Sub they're called substitutes, but really they're just foods in themselves, like tofu and tempeh, which are made from soybeans. You can make your curries without any of this sort of stuff, for example, using chickpeas instead of chicken. That would be the absolute healthier way of doing things. Um, there's a huge, huge range when it comes to plant-based meats. There are some that are made with less ingredients than others. There are some that are cheaper than others. There's some that taste really fantastic. There are some that are just very much soya-based, for example, or and a lot healthier. So it really, really depends. But personally, for me, there's other ones other than these that I might eat. But people love these. And like I said, they're great for transition. They're great for the environment, much better than meat. And we still know that these foods don't have the cholesterol in that meat have or the trans fat. They often have less saturated fat. And we know that red meat, even two portions a week, can increase our risk of type 2 diabetes.
Welcome back. Well, Labour has said it wants a police investigation into claims that Mark Menzies, the Conservative MP, misused campaign funds. I spoke to the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds, about that shortly before coming on air. Thank you very much for being on Politics Hub this evening. So we're talking about Mark Menzies on the show tonight, and I know that you've written to the chair of the Conservative Party uh, about the allegations and how they've handled it. What have you said? Well, these are bizarre and troubling allegations, and I've called on the Conservative Party to be really clear about when they heard about these allegations, what action they took, if any. It sounds like they heard about them right back in January and nothing was done until now. Also, whether they believe that campaign funding rules could have been broken, the legislation that's within the Fraud Act and so-called Paperis, the Political Parties, Elections and Referendums Act, whether that was also traduced through what has taken place. And you know, really here, I think there are very big questions for Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives to answer. You mentioned the, the rules over campaign funding and whether they've been broken. Now, I should say it's important to emphasise, you know, Mark Menzies denies wrongdoing. He says that he did act within the rules. Is there a wider issue here about how local party money can be used? So, you know, I think it's quite common, isn't it, for MPs to set up, you know, a local business group, because then you don't have to declare who's making the donations until they reach a certain threshold. I mean, should the rules themselves be looked at to make them more transparent? Well, to be honest, from first base, I think we need to understand from the Conservative Party whether their understanding of this situation is that rules were held to or otherwise, and it's not clear whether they've even conducted an investigation into that question. But then, of course, rules do need to be followed. That's very important. It's something that certainly the Labour Party takes uh, very seriously to make sure that we are complying. And that's the least, frankly, that people deserve, because they need to understand that politics is driven by a focus on what will actually improve people's lives, that, yes, it is funded, but that that funding comes from legitimate sources and that that is transparent and clear for everyone to see. You see, I feel like um, you're answering a slightly different question there about whether the rules have been broken and saying that the Labour Party would always follow the rules. Are the rules themselves fit for purpose? Do we need more transparency at how, over how local MPs, local campaigning can be funded? We believe overall there does need to be change around the panoply of rules that apply to members of parliament. That's why we set out plans for an integrity and ethics commission. But what appears to be the case here, and I will um, speak uh, very broadly because, of course, we don't know the details of what has taken place, but it seems like funds that would have been allocated uh, ultimately for campaigning, have not been spent on that. Now, of course, that's something for the Conservative Party and, if necessary, the police to be investigating, and they should have looked into it, it appears, on the Conservative Party side quite a bit earlier than now. It looks like it's only press reports that have led to that focus. So, to be frank, I don't think it's the rules themselves that are at issue here. I do think what's at issue is whether the Conservative Party, and particularly Rishi Sunak, has a grip on what his MPs are doing, and if there are problems, whether he's willing to actually deal with them. Keir Starmer has been willing to take action when there have been issues with behaviour in the Labour Party. He's got a grip on it. Working with me as party chair and David Evans as general secretary, we've not seen the same, I'm afraid, from Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives. Just taking a step back, because the backdrop to this is that we've seen a number of MPs suspended pending investigation, some standing down and forcing by-elections because of wrongdoing. Is this something that comes up a lot on the doorstep? And is there a risk that voters start thinking, they're all the same, I don't trust any of them? Well, of course there's that risk, and it's deeply concerning that we've seen so many different instances of this. In fact, this is a time when we've seen two MPs who've effectively sacked themselves in just two weeks, uh, standing down from the Conservative Party. We've got a by-election, of course, in Blackpool because of a Conservative MP who's accused of cash for questions, and that comes after so many different cases. And I think it is deeply concerning that because of this lack of grip 
on the situation I'm from Rishi Sunil. I'm just going to come in because I'm trying to ask, you know, broad questions about the conduct of our MPs. And yes, I absolutely acknowledge there's been a number of Conservative MPs, uh, just one person we're talking about tonight, but you know, a number of Conservative MPs suspended, forcing by-elections. But there have been cases in the Labour Party as well, right? You will, you'll accept that too. Durant Davis, for example, suspended after allegations of sexual harassment, which he denies. Nick Brown, mysterious complaint, we don't know what. He's now standing down as a Labour MP. Generally, is there a disillusionment among the public and do all of our MPs need to do a bit better? Well, if I may, actually, those cases and a number of other ones without going into any detail, I would say that they demonstrate that the Labour Party takes such issues very seriously, that any member of the Labour Party, if their behaviour has not been in line with our standards, the action will actually be taken in relation to them. That is absolutely critical for Keir Starmer and for the Labour Party as a whole. And of course, investigations may lead to a Member of Parliament being found not to have done anything wrong, but the Labour Party has made sure that investigations take place, that there's know, error, and that we've got a clear complaint system. And that is a difference. And am I frustrated about this situation? Yes because I think many people will just view all politicians in the same bracket. They will believe that political parties as a whole are not getting grip on these issues, when actually the Labour Party has worked hard. And we haven't always dealt with this properly in the past. We'd be the first to acknowledge that, but we've worked hard to set our own ship in order. And sadly, we've just not seen that from the Conservatives. And that is a big problem for all politicians. Annalise Todd speaking to me there, the chair of the Labour Party. To Holyrood now, where the Scottish Government has ditched its flagship target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 75% by 2030. Now, the decision follows a damning report from the Climate Change Committee, which said the target was no longer credible. The Scottish Government was the first in the world to declare a climate emergency, but it's missed a series of targets for cutting emissions. Announcing the move in the Scottish Parliament, the Minister for Net Zero accepted the 2030 goal is now out of reach. In this challenging context of cuts, UK backtracking, we accept the CCC's recent re-articulation that this Parliament's interim 2030 target is out of reach. We must now act to chart a course to 2045 at a pace and a scale that is feasible, fair and just. And with this in mind, I can today confirm that working with Parliament on a timetable, the Scottish Government will bring forward expedited legislation to address matters raised by the CCC and ensure our legislative framework better reflects the reality of long-term climate policy making. Well, how could this affect the SNP's power-sharing agreement with the Scottish Greens? Let's find out, shall we, with our next guest, the Green MSP. Ross Greer joins us now. Thanks for being on the show. Um, you must be pretty disappointed that this target's been ditched. The disappointment is in the years and decades of inaction that preceded this. The target has been changed, not abandoned completely. We do need to emphasise that. But the target has been changed because 2030's 75% target cannot be reached. But what we need now is a real focus on action that will make sure we hit the really important target, net zero by 2045. And with Greens in government, we are delivering that escalating action. The, the consequences um, of inaction over years and decades are what was announced today. But we are now massively scaling up. You know, the Greens have delivered free bus travel for young people in Scotland. You're not paying peak fares on the railways at the moment, thanks to us. £4.7 billion, a record amount on climate and nature this year alone. So that's the kind of action that will get us back on track to that longer term target, the net zero 2045 one. But there, there's no escaping how disappointing a day this is for Scotland and for the planet. At the same time, though, I feel like you're speaking a bit as if you're still in opposition. You're in government. You know, you, you've been in government with, you know, the SNP since 2021 and you can't even get them to not only, you know, stick to their green targets, but as you say, like, not follow through in the policies in the years preceding as well. I mean, some people might be thinking, what is the point of the Scottish Greens? No, to be clear, the years and decades of inaction were from before the Greens joined the government. As soon as we joined the government in 20. 
into 21. Climate action has massively scaled up. But the point is, these are policies that take time. You don't snap your fingers and uh, emissions start falling straight away. And in fact, it, the Climate Change Committee, the independent advisors to all UK governments, have singled out the work that Greens are doing in the Scottish government on making our homes cheaper and greener to heat and said, that's the kind of ambition we need from everybody else in every other sector. But we're proud of the fact that in the last two and a half years, action to tackle the climate crisis has massively scaled up and that's what's going to get us towards that 2045 target. Unfortunately, the extent to which we were off track from the 2030 target was decided by policies from long before we joined the government. Um, at the same time, I guess some people listening to it might be thinking it, it's a classic case of the kind of action not not matching up with the rhetoric, if you like, saying, so, you know, the Scottish government was the first in the world to declare a climate emergency, but since then it's just kept missing green targets. Is this just another example of, you know, the, the, the ambitions up here, but then if you have to make a difficult decision, then politicians just shy away from it? Absolutely. When the initial climate targets were set in 2009 and then the new targets in 2019, every party agreed on uh, ambitious targets. But what the Greens were saying back then was we need action to match this. And unfortunately, that clearly wasn't the case. It's a combination of inaction at a Scottish level, but also outright hostility at a UK level. The Scottish government's obviously not a sovereign government. It doesn't have the full powers of a national government. The UK government has cut Scotland's infrastructure budget by half a billion pounds this year alone. And that's the budget that we need to use to improve our railways, to transition our bus fleet to zero carbon vehicles, to expand electric vehicle charging, to do that work on people's homes to make them uh, cheaper and greener. Okay. The targets were set on the assumption that we were working with a cooperative UK government. And unfortunately, we now have the opposite of that. We have one that's actively sabotaging our efforts to tackle the climate emergency. I'm going to uh, jump in and leave it there because we do have a bit of breaking news. But thank you very much for your time today. Uh, just to update you on a story we've been uh, following today, uh, because we have had a statement through uh, from Scottish police uh, saying a 59-year-old man has today been charged in connection with the embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. We can bring in our Scotland correspondent, Connor Gillies. Connor, what do you know? Uh, this is serious. It is significant. The SNP and the long-running police investigation examining the party's funding and the party's finances uh, has had a long road to this moment. And in the last few seconds, Police Scotland detectives have confirmed that 59-year-old Peter Murrell, the husband of the former First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, the former chief executive of the party for nearly 20 years, 59-year-old Peter Murrell has been charged, in their words, in connection with embezzlement of funds from the Scottish National Party. Uh, he was brought into custody, we understand, just after nine o'clock this morning and spent, uh, well, 10 hours almost facing questions from those officers and he was released from custody in the last few minutes at Falkirk Police Station here in Scotland. Uh, and then came the news, the confirmation that he has been charged. Uh, there is very, very little that we can say now as clearly this is an active uh, proceedings in terms of the judicial process uh, and details are very scarce in terms of what we can report now on that investigation. It was dubbed Operation Branch Form and all we can say now is that it was focusing on the funding and finances. There's no doubt this is a difficult moment for the SNP. It's a difficult moment for the former First Minister of Scotland. But all of those involved in the justice system here in Scotland, all of those in terms of the policing side of things, will be just wanting to let this breathe, to let uh, justice take its course. Uh, and that is very much um, a, a, a moment, a significant moment here in Scotland that we'll need to settle in. Uh, Connor, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Connor Gillies there in Edinburgh. Uh, and as Connor was saying, difficult uh, to go into too many details now uh, that Peter Murrell has been charged, but a significant moment. Peter Murrell, the former chief executive of the SNP, charged uh, by police. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. The former leadership hopefuls jockeying for prominence in the Conservative Party. How the former Prime Minister Liz Truss's new book is in breach of Cabinet Office rules. In 
tailored suits. And we'll turn to AI to see if it can write pop hits inspired by our politicians. Welcome back. A new book by Liz Truss detailing her short time in Downing Street has made headlines this week for some of the more astonishing claims made by the former Prime Minister. But now we're told the book is also in breach of Cabinet Office rules. Well, our Chief Political Co Correspondent John Craig joins us now to explain. John, what is going on? Well, you could say there's no such thing as bad publicity. Second example this week, Nigel Farage, the Belgian police in Brussels and the mayor and so on. And now more publicity for Liz Truss's book <laughs> uh, because the Cabinet Office is now saying she broke the rules on uh, ex-ministers or ex-prime ministers' uh, memoirs by not getting them properly cleared. Now... Uh, the book includes all sorts of revelations about, for example, conversations with the Queen, being very rude about uh, Treasury civil servants, the Governor of the Bank of England, and so on. What the Cabinet Office have said tonight is, this book was submitted to the Cabinet Office for review. While we would not publicise the details of any discussions, we did not agree to the final wording. So the author is in breach of the Radcliffe Rules. What are they, you're going to say? I, well, I have no idea what the Radcliffe rules are. I That's had right. to look it up. Oh, even John had to look it up. They I am old enough school. to remember the Crossman diaries. I don't know if you two are. I'm but not too young, John. Richard Crossman <laughs> was a Labour cabinet minister who published diaries 
very a revealing dar is what happened in Cabinet. And in the 1970s, uh, Harold Wilson's government tried to block their publication. Anyway, like all governments do, they set up a committee headed by Lord Radcliffe, who came up with these rules on ministerial memoirs. And that's the rules that she's broken. Re there's been another recent example. Nadine Dorries got into trouble with the Cabinet Office over her book called The Plot. Now, Liz Truss's book is called Ten Years to Save the West. It's not had great reviews, I have to say. Now, it, what it seems that where she's got into trouble is the conversations with the Queen. She says the Queen said, pace yourself. And when she was rude... Uh, when she talked about the mini-budget, the role of officials and the Bank of England, that's where she's got into trouble. Okay. But great publicity. Yeah, I have to say, we've been talking about Liz Truss's book quite a lot already this week. Uh, John, thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, Alva, I mean, mm. what, you could make it up. No, or could you? I mean, the deep, the deep yeah. state forcing Liz, Liz exactly. Truss. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm loving every minute of the Liz Truss book tour. I think we're all getting a lot of mileage out of it. I mean, the what we, what um, your colleague Sam Coates pointed out about, you know, her reflections when the Queen died, thinking to herself, why me? <laughs> um, yeah, extraordinary, but um, but still, I think significant being serious for a former prime minister to break these rules. I mean, we, we, are, we are all familiar with the fact that if you are a former prime minister, a former cabinet minister, you need to get the cabinet office to check your memoir first. Mm. Um, clearly she did that and then took a decision from what John was saying to go ahead with publication anyway. They didn't agree a fi final terms. That, that's, I think, quite interesting. Uh, Alva uh, says she's loving every minute of the Liz Truss memoirs. Tim, are you loving every minute of the Liz Truss memoirs? <laughs> I think Keir Starmer is probably loving every minute of it. I, but I tell you who, are, who aren't enjoying it. Conservative councillors out there on the you know, front door doorstep at the moment trying to get their campaigns in shape. And probably the most unpopular Prime Minister we've had in living memory is there two weeks before campaign day reminding everyone of that dreadful six-week period when the Conservative Party got a reputation for wrecking the economy. I, I really have no time for Liz Truss. Anyone with any sense of dignity would have absented themselves from the political... She should have gone and run a hotel in the Outer Hebrides or something, you know, to actually still be at the forefront of politics without any real apology for what she did. I, I really think she's a disgrace, actually, but... John Story, this will be, you know, this is what she'll be able to say was that the deep state, as Alva said, is thwarting her attempts to publish. And although John is right, it's had very bad reviews, the book's actually doing quite well in and sales. And they it sold out, I think, didn't they? Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a freak show element to it. People think, what on earth is she going to write? And so I think people are reading it, but not out of respect for her argument, thinking, what on earth is she writing now? You could argue that uh, Theresa May has given a good example of how a former Prime Minister should behave yeah. with dignity in the House of Commons, made good contributions. She's standing down now. Liz Truss has talked about standing again, playing a part. She hasn't even ruled out making a comeback. Well, you think there's going to be a leadership contest in two weeks? Maybe we're going to get Liz Truss running. <laughs> well, she's <laughs> going to be the launch to Ian Dell, she said she had unfinished business, that she somehow wanted to come back. If I had any hair left, I would be tearing it out. It's just extraordinary. <laughs> and thanks very much indeed. Uh, lively discussion. John, thank you very much for bringing us up to speed as well. Well, the ongoing uh, fallout from all of the political stories that we've been uh, discussing this evening, sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the political journalist Theo Usherwood and the political correspondent for Politics, Jay, Ava Santina Evans. Still to come on the Politics Hub. In tailored suits. You're not going to want to miss this. Could Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer inspire pop hits of the future? We turn to AI to find out. Big stories don't always come from big cities. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent and this is where I grew up. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. 
This is what they're up against, that the wind is the really big problem. It is back-breaking work and the smoke is thick. It's been working well. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? So. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. We're terrified. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Hopefully this will be the last wave. I never knew they would make it. It's amazing. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. Wales was the first to introduce the plastic bag charge. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Hello and welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now, are you a Swifty? Well, if you are, it is an exciting day tomorrow because Taylor Swift's hugely anticipated 11th album is going to be released. Now, She's never hidden the fact that she writes songs about love, about heartbreak, lots of songs entitled Dear John, Hey Stephen, and of course, famously, London Boy, which we thought we were gonna lean into tonight because until the big news tomorrow when it's released, we thought we could actually ask an AI music generator to make up a song in the style of Taylor Swift about some of that very own London boys, Rishi Sunak and <laughs> Keir Starmer. The titles of the songs, Suits and Resolutions, and suits of valour. So you can see a bit of a theme here, but which is which? Right, let's have a listen. Here's the first one. In tailored suits, he strides with plans in his mind's eye while numbers speak his truth. There you go, that is Rishi Sunak in the style of Taylor Swift. Tailored soups, his numbers speaking the truth, charting the course through fiscal storms. What do you make of it? I mean, I loved it, which shows I have absolutely no taste, so... <laughs> 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 That's why I'm a Swifty. I go out and buy that. <laughs> you wish, I love it, I absolutely love it. I quite like Taylor Swift as well. I think, mm. it's, I think it's okay, I think it's all right. How about you, Swifty? Oh, I, no, I'm not a Swifty. I can still remember some time. You, you, you were both too young again, but I remember. Meet the challenge, make the change. Things will never be <laughs> the same. And that was a Labour song. I think it was the 1983 campaign. And so anything could be... Political songs are so naff. Mm. That at least has a sort okay. of... A, it has a little rhythm and a style yeah, about it. Yeah, I think, I think so. the Prime Minister would be quite happy as well, kind of leaning into, you know, his kind of fiscal credibility. Yeah. Let's Get rid of the blue wash, though. That doesn't work. Not sure about that. No, no. Um, right, next one. Here's Keir Starmer. Here in the halls, the voice of reason, a lawyer's heart in the toughest season. Fighting for right with each legislation, yet wears a suit, not a cape in this nation. Here with the gaze set on tomorrow, 
carries the hope to outshine sorrow. I mean, <laughs> rhyming legislation with nation. I mean, that's pretty good, <laughs> I have to say. Like, I quite like what AI is doing there. What do you reckon? <laughs> Labour's next campaign song. It's oh. quite catchy, I it, thought. It sort of had a more like a, maybe we, if Keir Starmer was running for a governor in the American South. Maybe it would work a little bit better. Yeah, it's a little gone. bit sort of a new Beyonce than, <laughs> uh, than um, uh, British. But uh, um, I think you should, Sky News should perhaps focus on politics rather than elections. Well, it was songs. AI, we should say, rather. <laughs> it's not my own song mating uh, thing. Um, I have to say, I think they've done a better job than I would have done. Uh, we caught, of course, though, we couldn't resist making one about our own show, The Politics Hub. Oh. Uh, we can have a little listen uh, to debates and insights. Share my views with you, oh darling And the insight you brought to light and kind Help to shape every view In this room where debates flare Ideas fly through the air So sharp and profound this actually, that's the first time I've seen that, and I have to say, I found that really quite deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bizarre. A little bit like a tribute to you. It was a bit <laughs> weird, a bit intense. Um, uh, anyway, I'm not sure. I, 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 um, I think you should run for Prime Minister, Sophie. I think you're mm. probably a lot better poised than those two politicians that went before. So when are you announcing your, uh, your campaign <laughs> bid? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, again, it was quite catchy. Some of the lyrics were pretty good. You know, debates flare, ideas flying through the air. It's quite complimentary of politics hub. We didn't. Mm -hmm. we, we, this is literally AI as well, right? So we yeah. didn't. We didn't. You know, do it ourselves. That really was but... the first time you saw it. Yeah, yeah it, it was. That was yeah. brave. That was it was. Brave. I'm a bit um, cringed out. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> It, it had the slight air of, of, of the kind of coverage you get if you, you know, were to hit an untimely end. The sort of, <laughs> <laughs> the, sort of the, the slow motion footage of. So of basically, basically if good I die, that would be a great. Yeah, yeah so we'll you have that film. Yeah, would yeah. you be happy with that? Victory film. The okay, victory oh, film, thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess. I think, you know. I think we should cut now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just totally live at home. Okay. I feel like the politics hub is more upbeat than that. Yeah, normally. I think you're right. And also, there are some, you know, I'm thinking kind of shake. Shake it off, you know. That's Taylor mm. is quite. She's quite catchy. She's quite upbeat. Mm. You haven't got tickets for the uh, no, government concert. No, I haven't. But no. um, I think they're they're too difficult to get. I yeah. have to say, mm. um, I'd go and see her though. I'd quite enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, and I can't wait for the new album tomorrow. I think there are lots of fifties Swifties in, in Westminster. Yeah, I think it's be true. excited for this. <laughs> uh, we're nearly out of uh, time. Thanks both very much uh, for tonight. Uh, that is it from us this evening. I'll see you back here on Monday at seven pm. Up next, it's UK tonight with Sarah Jean, Jane Mee. See you Monday.